Hi, and welcome back to another video. In this video, we're going to be analyzing JD.com. Ticker symbol is JD. They are a Chinese e commerce company that operates a first party consumer e commerce platform that is similar to the likes of Amazon and also a third party marketplace for merchants that is similar to the likes of Alibaba's e commerce business. Unlike its fierce rival Alibaba, JD actually takes most of its revenues from the first party e commerce and logistics platform, which means it owns its own inventories and fulfills its own orders via a first party logistics network, not just an e-commerce marketplace that facilitates the buying and selling of products from businesses to consumers. Their operating business model is simple and proven to be successful, which makes JD a very interesting play. Not many people can't get to grips with what they're trying to do in e-commerce. Essentially, their future success relies on the growth of China's e-commerce and JD's ability to stay at or around the top of that market. But they also have some spin-off plays that don't get reported under the operating business results, but JD, the holding company that we buy the rights to when we buy the stock, owns the majority of these businesses and their profits. Some of these spin-off plays complement the core business and include things like JD Health, uh, JD Cloud and AI, JD Logistics and Shipping, and JD Financial and Investments. There are others that I haven't mentioned here, but these contribute the most profits back to JD by way of investment income or capital gains. The stock has performed very well since around 2019, getting a 3x in price from January 19 to today's day. On face value, the stock looks well priced at 17 times PE ratio. It could be fairly priced, but there are some things that we need to look into in a bit more detail that may or may not alter our view on that. First, before we dive into that, let's give you some details as to why JD.com should be a stock that's on your radar or you should at least look at into the future. Firstly, China, which is its market, is the largest e-commerce market in the world today with 1.5 trillion in total retail sales as of 2019. That is almost three times as large as the United States and about 10 times as large as the United Kingdom, which is the third biggest country for e-commerce. Not only that, but it's the country that's been growing at the quickest rate over the past five to six years. E-commerce growth in China has been a 44% compound annual growth rate since 2014 up until the end of 2020. And for total e-commerce, JD is currently the second largest uh, company that operates within this market. They're most fierce competitor, as I mentioned, is Alibaba with the largest amount of market share. But Alibaba appeals to a much wider spectrum of e-commerce with their business-to-business -business section and things like that. JD.com, in terms of business-to-consumer e-commerce or retail e-commerce, is still the second largest, but they get a little bit closer to Alibaba and Alibaba's Tmall, to be exact. As of the end of 2019, JD.com had 25% market share. So this is a company that has a very big stake in a fast growing industry or an industry that had been growing rapidly for the past sort of five to 10 years. And you can see it in JD.com's five to 10 year growth rate. It's been somewhat amazing the growth that they've achieved over the past 10 years. But we're not too bothered about, I mean, obviously it's great to have growth in the past, but what we want to know today is how quickly is e-commerce in China set to grow for the next five to 10 years? And how likely is it that JD.com will be a beneficiary from that? And according to Research and Markets, which is a reputable source, they've said that over the next four years, from 2020 to 2024, the Chinese business-to-consumer e-commerce market, which is what JD.com are in, will grow at a compound annual growth rate of 31% during the forecasted period. And this is going to be driven by an increase in internet smartphone penetration, free shipping, unproblematic return policies, and easy payment options. So basically, the fact that everything's going to be so much easier um, for customers to deal in e-commerce than it is to, to do in brick and mortar or any of the other legacy ways of doing things is going to drive this growth. And this is all stuff that JD.com are pushing for at the moment. They're, they're pushing as hard as they can to make everything as easy for the customer as possible. And you can see it in the growth in a lot of these businesses at the moment, not just JD.com, but Alibaba, who we've looked at before. A lot of these e-commerce plays and Pinduoduo as well, they're growing at a very fast rate. And I don't see that slowing down anytime soon. If anything, the pandemic and what's happened in the past year or so is going to speed this process up. And I think a 31% compound annual growth rate for the next three to four years is very much justified. So with all that in mind, JD obviously looks like a very cheap stock because it's got PE ratio 17 times. It looks like their market is set to grow above 30% for the next 
five years into the future. So JD should get a good capture of that, you would imagine. But going back to what I said at the start of the video where we need to dig a little bit deeper uh, into this valuation, just to get an idea of where the earnings are coming from and if this P of 17 actually rings true. So I'm here in Yahoo Finance and I'll just show you on the income statement here what I mean. So we've got the operating income and this is in RMB by the way, so it won't make much sense to you, but I do have a spreadsheet or I have it in my valuation spreadsheet. I have it split out in US dollars, which will look a little bit clearer, but just for demonstration purposes at the moment, we can see that they made 10 billion in operating income that's from their operating businesses, which is the, the business to consumer e-commerce portion of the business, just the operating part of the business. Only made 10 billion in operating income on 745 billion of revenue. So not a very good margin there. That's less than 2% margin. But then we get to EBIT or actually up here, it's called pre-tax income, pretty much the same thing, earnings before interest and taxes. We can see that income shoots up to 50 billion RMB, up from 10 billion. And what's driving that is that non-operating income that we can see here, 32 billion RMB, and that gets them to pre-tax income of 50 billion RMB. And then with tax, which they've got a tiny tax provision because actually on the operating earnings, they didn't make a huge amount, we get net income attributable to stockholders of 49 billion RMB. Now on 10 billion of operating income, that means that from the net income or even earnings per share when this is diluted down to a share count, the majority of it has come from non-operating income. And what that is, is some you know real investment income in terms of those subsidiary companies that they own that are JD owned companies, 100% or 80 or 90%, whatever they are. And that a lot of it is the real earnings of those companies. You would say only fair that they appear in the holding company's earnings or look through earnings. But in their annual report, JD actually says that their non-operating income, what was driving it, the substantial increase was due to the increase in net gain arising from increases in the market prices of their equity investments in publicly traded companies. And so this is fine to a degree, um, but what we need to realize that that 17 times PE maybe isn't a 17 times PE if we normalize those earnings because the shoot up that they've had in the publicly traded investments that they have or the equity investments that they have, it's probably not going to appear year on year. What I'm going to do is take out equity portfolio gains I'm going to estimate based off their equity portfolio now what their gains will be going into the future and try and focus more on the operating business and how that margin can start to get better and how the operating businesses will grow. I will account for some of the subsidiary companies and obviously the uh, portfolio that they have. But unfortunately, I'm not going to be estimating them off of a 7% EBIT margin like they've got at the moment based off of those security gains earnings. And look, with that out of the way, it isn't all doom and gloom on JD.com. JD.com is actually a very well-priced stock in my opinion, even with all of that that was just mentioned. As I told you, a growing part of their revenue is the services revenues, which is the logistics company where they outsource logistics for other people, the marketplace business as well, which is a third-party e-commerce platform where they don't buy all of the products themselves and facilitate all of the logistics. That part of the business is growing at 53% versus the business to consumer or core commerce business that's growing at 28%. So that part of the business is set to become a larger part of overall revenues. And of course, with the nature of that business, it's a higher margin portion of the business. Not necessarily right now because they're investing in it to grow, but that will become a higher gross margin and a higher bottom line margin part of JD.com's business. So we're going to account for that slightly in our forecast here going into the future. What we spoke about earlier, we've got the securities gain, which is four and a half billion for 2020. If we deduct that out of the EBIT, then that gives us a operating and non-operating income that is excluding the equity portfolio of around three and a half billion, which is not an amazing margin, but around three to three and a half percent. So better than that operating income number that's showing there at 1.6%. Now, free cash flow is actually really good because of course, they are receiving or theoretically receiving cash items or cash income from these investments. Essentially, anything that's not a non-cash item or expensed as a non-cash item can be added back into the cash flow statement. So that's why free cash flow is high there. And we're going to estimate it going forward based off of the uh, EBIT or operating income and try and add a little bit of consistency in there with the earnings. Now, here I've got the equity portfolio, which I'm going to include. It's not going to make up a massive part of this valuation, but it's 14 and a half billion US dollars from what I can see at the moment. Now, I've got that growing at around 10% or giving us 10% income, if you like. 
uh, totaling that up as we get to 2025. So that equity portfolio could be worth $23.5 billion in 2025. So we're going to take those equity earnings and we're going to add them back into the earnings if we need to. We may not even need to. But realistically, you look at the numbers, they're not huge relative to what JD does at the moment. Now, getting onto the forecast in a little bit more detail. So my growth rate for JD.com over the next five years, at a minimum, I've got it at 15%. And that's with uh, addressable market growth of a minimum of 25% going into the future. Uh, we actually saw a report that said 31%. So we're estimating that JD.com will be half of that. So that's a conservative growth estimate in my eyes. 15% gets us up to $229 billion of revenue in 2025. So essentially a double from here. And then for our margin profile, I've got it at 5% next year. So a slight improvement. It's gradually going to creep up. Not quite to 10%, but nearer to 10% operating margin or EBIT margin as that services portion of the business starts to mature. It starts to become a larger part of total revenues. And also, by that point, you hope that the business to consumer portion of the business will start to be a little bit more profitable as well. Now, free cash flow, uh, which is going to be our measure of value across that period, is 67% of EBIT, which is what it was last year. It's been higher than that. It's been lower than that but we're going to say that it's going to level out as it was last year. Shares outstanding. I haven't got growing, but we can look at what happens if they do start to dilute shareholders and how that affects the valuation. And you just see here, it already seems like a cheap stock. We've got a free cash flow yield of around 4%, which is good in this market, good in a lot of markets. Uh, that free cash flow yield starts to get even better as time goes on. If these forecasts play out, you'll have a 10.5% free cash flow yield by 2025, which you look at and you think there's no point selling the stock at that point. A 10% free cash flow yield that's likely to grow into the future, that's going to be a hard stock to want to sell. And an EV to EBIT that climbs all the way down to five times 2025 expected EV to EBIT. My terminal values I've kept, I'd like to call them very conservative. I've got a free cash flow yield of 5%, which like we covered in the last video, is a good price to pick up a stock in a lot of market environments, especially for a company that's still going to be growing at that point. And then I've gone with a perpetual growth method, which is just to balance out the multiple and check that our multiple looks about right and a 3% perpetual growth rate. You know, when you think the growth rate of China at the moment is 8 to 9%, you know, this is very similar to the last video that we had on Baidu in terms of uh, these growth rates and these multiples for a company that's sitting in an economy that's growing rapidly and also a market that's growing rapidly as well. These are very conservative estimates for a terminal value multiple, if you ask me. Now, just quickly, if we get to the DCF, that gives us an enterprise value of 309 billion in 2025. And then we, uh, lesser debt plus the cash, we get a market cap of around 344 billion in 2025, or a price target of $215 per share. That's an expected return of 2.6 times in just five short years. And so based off a discount rate of 15%, which is my required rate of return, which that's why I discount all of my values back 15% because that's the return I want to get on my investments. We get an intrinsic value for JD.com today of 179 billion if you're buying the whole company and a share price of $112 per share, which means there's 35% upside to this stock at the moment. And we can pick it up with a 25% margin of safety on the price today, which is around $83 to $84. And so based off my valuation, it looks like a really attractive stock. Not to mention that we're only going with $229 billion of revenue by 2025, when the retail e-commerce market is expected to reach $3.5 trillion in sales by 2024. It's expected to double from where it was in 2019 and 2020. That's how big Chinese e-commerce retail sales is going to be. And they're making up a tiny portion of that market. That market share for JD.com will only be 6.4% if they can reach these revenue targets. They've got bigger market share than that now. So that's how conservative that growth rate is. And obviously, JD.com is not the only Chinese stock at the moment that I believe is selling a fairly big discount to the rest of the market, especially to the rest of the big tech stocks or, or high growth stocks in the market, mainly because there's concern around the delisting of Chinese stocks in the US. Now, I have covered my thoughts on this in the previous video and Baidu, so I'm not going to go over it in a lot of detail on this one. What I would say is, of course, there is a risk that these Chinese companies could be delisted. I think it's very unlikely, and I've given my reasons for that. But if you are really concerned, 
you can pick these stocks up on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and they're selling at exactly the same price with exactly the same financials. So there's an option to avoid that problem altogether. And that's all I'm gonna say about that. And that's pretty much it for this video, guys. Wanted to get something out on JD.com. People had been requesting it in the comments. People had been requesting it on the Patreon and Discord. It looks like an attractive stock to me. A lot of upside there. I'm going to think about adding it to my portfolio. I definitely do want China exposure. I do have Alibaba at the moment. I probably think Alibaba is a stronger pick out of these two. But there definitely does look like there's a lot of upside with this one as well. So I'll do a little bit more digging and then I will let you know if I make a purchase. This spreadsheet, as always, is gonna be available on the Patreon to all of our patrons and on the Discord, so go and check that out. I'll leave a link in the description if you're interested in supporting the channel. If you enjoyed the video, though, leave a like. I'd appreciate that very much. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, but thank you for watching. Until next time, good luck with all of your investments.